Welcome to our program this evening, a gala for liberty, with the presentation of the Alexis de Tocqueville Awards, which as many of you know are named for the 19th century political philosopher and author of the famous book, Democracy in America. My name is David Thoreau, and I'm the president of the Independent Institute. We're delighted to have you join with us tonight, and I hope that you will really enjoy our program this evening. For those of you who are new to the Independent Institute, the Institute is a nonprofit public policy research organization that sponsors in-depth studies of major social and economic issues. The results are published as books and other publications and form the basis of numerous conference and media programs. More than 20 years ago, we founded the Institute to examine the actual nature and consequences of government policy. But instead of succumbing to the popular or political biases, trends, phobias, narcissism, or moral ambiguities, we are ever mindful that truth, goodness, justice, and liberty are not illusions. Indeed, there are certain non-negotiable presuppositions upon which human inquiry and science, the rule of law, and free civilization rest. We seek to explore such matters and address important questions that might otherwise be ignored, including ones normally considered out of the box or controversial or politically incorrect, but which we believe may likely be not just crucial to our understanding, but enable us to get to real answers and long-lasting solutions. As a result, the Institute was founded to cut through the noise and spin of special interest public policy debate in the US and elsewhere. In order to do so, we had to establish a new kind of institute, one of a kind, frankly, in the public policy field which, as many of you know, is dominated by partisan advocacy groups of virtually every stripe imaginable. In our case, without the financial backing of any interest group, we became the first garage think tank. <laughs> and 20 years later, we operate with more than 140 research fellows in the US and around the world. So we invite you to get to know us better. We hope that you'll enjoy getting beyond the stereotypes of left and right into the realm of innovative, bold ideas. And we believe that such ideas are the key to a brighter future. In your gift bag, for example, you'll find the copy of a new book from us edited by our senior fellow, Alvaro Vargas Llosa, entitled Lessons from the Poor that chronicles enterprise-based, entrepreneurial-based success stories in uplifting people out of abject poverty in Latin America and Africa, despite rampant corruption and government barriers of all sorts. You'll also find a copy of our quarterly journal, The Independent Review, and other information about our program. In the course of our work, we also take special interest in recognizing individuals whose contributions are so unusual, so noteworthy, and so effective that we believe they merit special attention. And tonight's honorees are exemplary in this regard. However, before we begin, I want to note that in making tonight's dinner possible, the assistance of many wonderful people was critical. First of all, we're privileged to have had five world-renowned figures who have graced us as honorary co-chairs, Jihan El Sadat, the Dalai Lama, Lord Brian Griffiths, Vaclav Klaus, and Muhammad Yunus. The dinner committee was co-chaired by six distinguished business leaders who I also want to sincerely thank. Bob Allspaugh, retired CEO of KPMG International. Tim Draper, founding and managing director of Draper Fisher Jurvetson Associates. Bob Galvin, chairman emeritus of Motorola. Mike Moe, co-founder and former chairman and CEO of Think Pan Muir. Bill Rudder, Chairman of Synergetics, and Lisa Stevens, Regional President of Wells Fargo Bank. 
I also want to thank the many members of the dinner committee, each of whose participation really helped form the basis for tonight's program. And I also want to thank the people at Kendall Jackson Vineyard Estates and Freemark Abbey Winer Winery, who have very generously provided the superb wines for tonight's dinner, which we'll be enjoying. And in this regard, I want to express our special gratitude to our friend John Bryan. I also want to thank Hugesian Flowers that provided the beautiful flower table centerpieces. Seas Candies deserves our special thanks for generous donations of the fine chocolate confections. I also especially want to thank the John Santos Sextet. Were they just sensational? I mean, really. I also want to thank our friends at the Exploratorium, our good friend Janine Vaughn, and videographer Jean Lanzaga. But most especially, I want to thank Juliana Jelinek for overseeing our entire gala enterprise. If she would please stand. <laughs> and also the, the team that she uh, headed up, including Joseph Asbell and Abby Shepard, if they would stand. In fact, if the entire Institute staff uh, could stand because they're all deeply involved in the project. I would also like to introduce a number of the Institute's board members who are with us tonight. And if you would please stand. Gil Collins, Peter Howley, Isabel Speakman Johnson, Dieter Tate, and Mary Thoreau. We're very grateful to you all. Before I leave you to, to enjoy the rest of your first course, I want to refer you in your printed dinner program for tonight's schedule, which is divided into three segments or courses. Each course is dedicated to one of our honorees. We will break between courses or segments as well will be shown on the screens that you see above. We also have question cards on each table for your use in submitting questions. Those of you with questions are asked to please have them ready to be picked up before the dessert course, and we'll have people circling uh, during that time to pick up your cards. At this point, I'd like to introduce my good friend, Reverend Alan Jones, Dean of Grace Cathedral, who will kindly lead us in the invocation. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you that you have planted in the human heart the longing for liberty. We thank you that you have shaped us for freedom and, of course, to rise up among us champions of the human spirit. Help us to discern liberty's gift and freedom's burden by our understanding that no one is fully free while others are enslaved. No one enjoys the privileges of liberty without taking on its responsibilities. And these privileges push us to ensure that every member of the human family is truly free. We thank you for the power of this vision which has inflamed the hearts of courageous men and women throughout the ages down to our own day. Freedom fighters, artists, imaginative philanthropists and lonely visionaries. As we seek to embody the four classic freedoms, freedom from want, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from fear, give us that fifth and greatest freedom of all, the freedom of knowing that what we choose to do is in conformity with our inalienable dignity as human beings, that our freedom may not be squandered on the trivial, but placed in the service of the common good. We ask for courage to fight for freedom and stand for liberty in challenging times, even as vast, impoverished, and rapidly expanding populations whose ways and values are only dimly understood press up against our rich and seemingly ordered society. We affirm that the future may be germinating today not in a boardroom in London 
or an office in Washington or in a bank in Tokyo or Beijing, but in some remote outpost or other, a kindly British orphanage in the grim foothills of Peru, a house for the dying in a back street of Calcutta, an easygoing French medical team at the starving edge of the desert, a mission to Somalia by Irish social workers who remember their own great hunger, a nursery program to assist convict mothers at a New York prison, in some unheralded corner where great-hearted human beings are committed to loving in an extraordinary way, and in their very being are the bearers of liberty. May it be so. Amen. Thank you, Alan, and bon appetit. <laughs> Our first honoree is William K. Bowes, Jr. <laughs> Bill is the founding partner of U.S. Venture Partners and has labored for decades as an investment pioneer, venture capitalist, an entrepreneur's entrepreneur, a philanthropist, and much more. We'd like to share a short video about this truly exceptional man. I want to thank the Exploratorium for helping us in that regard. They used to call him U2 before he got married. He was, lived in an apartment with some people. And he knew everything, but he didn't say anything. And they said it was like the U2, just circling over and gathering information. That's sort of Bill. You have no idea how much he knows about everything, because he's not going to tell you. When Bill has something to say, it's a very good idea to listen. And he won't use a lot of words to say it. And I think people do listen. He has a, he has a uh, gravitas that's impressive. No, I knew his parents pretty well. And they were both gentlemanly and gentlewomanly people. His, his mother was a doctor. His dad was an was a investor in a number of projects. Very uh, quiet-spoken people, uh, probably uh, Bill got his self-confidence from being loved and respected as a kid. Most prominent quality of Bill is honesty and integrity. There's lots of other fine qualities, but that one runs through everything he does and all his behavior. Uh, along with that, he has a very keen intelligence, so that he sees things in depth uh, and can analyze situations and sometimes in a few words sum up some situation that makes us all understand it better. He's definitely a risk taker. He, uh, you know, you can't be in the venture capital business and be as successful as Bill is without taking huge risks. It means you have to start companies from ground zero. And um, those companies don't always work out well for all of us, including Bill. I think um, Bill could spot with a lot of skill a situation that didn't, it wasn't an existing company. Some people with an idea, some technology in a marketplace that they could serve. Bill had a really good way of not only positioning himself to hear about those opportunities, but to picture what that could look like when made into a business. The one thing about Bill is, that's amazing, is that he is probably, in my view, you know, one of the very, very top venture capitalists in the Valley, and he's probably the most humble of all of them. And, and that's just the mark of just a true, true person, a mensch. <laughs> What motivates Bill to achieve the game, the, mm -hmm. the intellectual game? Yeah. Learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not about anything material. He couldn't care less. I mean, definitely couldn't care less. <laughs> I'm sure that when he thinks about Amgen, uh, far from his mind is the financial success. I think what he looks at is, is what this company has been able to do for people. We've treated now over nine million people around the world with medicine and these are people with really serious illness 
uh, some of whom, maybe even many of whom, wouldn't be alive without our medicines. They certainly wouldn't have the quality of life. I think his contribution is that he seeds, you know, it, it's, it doesn't stop just with Bill. It, he seeds it through other people to continue um, the legacy, to, to keep learning, to keep um, funding good ideas. So it doesn't, he, it's sort of, he's the, the germinator. <laughs> he has been very interested in health and health related issues so that he knew how to bear down on, uh, to find places and bear down on them that were providing key cures or key alleviation of human suffering. He has courage. He never thought about, would somebody not like it? Would somebody call him not conservative? Or would somebody call him liberal? That, that, that doesn't enter his mind. That kind of stuff doesn't interest Bill. He likes to take positions on things that he believes will decrease human suffering, increase human liberty. We can't talk about Bill without talking about Uda. And uh, those two guys, as a couple, are uh, unique. Uh, their appetite for life, for adventure, for helping other people uh, is, is unmatched in my experience. He's been very involved in the lives of a lot of younger people, either educating them, backing them, nurturing them. And I think that for him, it's just a joy to watch people succeed through his influence. When Bill gets an award, particularly an award that's, that has this much uh, elaborate preparation, he will be amused and he'll be pleased and uh, be happy about it in his own way, a quiet way. I think that those of us who had a chance to help make this video are really honored that, that we were chosen because it gives us a chance to say some things we'd never say to Bill personally. He's a wonderful friend, a very, very fine human being, and I really love the uh, opportunity to say so in public. Few can better discuss the significance of Bill Bowes and his work than our next speaker. Michael Boskin is the Tully Friedman Professor of Economics and Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. He's former chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Michael's the author of more than 100 books and scholarly articles. He received his PhD here in the Bay Area in economics at UC Berkeley, my alma mater. Good choice. Sorry, this never. And he is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Adam Smith Prize. Michael Boskin. Thank you very much, David. And before I begin my uh, remarks about Bill, let me just congratulate you and the Independent Institute on all the important uh, things you do. Uh, liberty is not something to be taken lightly. Uh, we've all had experiences in our lifetime, many of us of my generation and younger, much fewer than people of Bill's generation and older about what the sacrifices people have had to make for that liberty uh, in, for America and around the world, but, and that is being repeated around the world now in a variety of places, and you'll hear a lot more about that uh, as we progress through the evening. But again, congratulations, David, and thank all of you for being here to support the Institute. Uh, it's important for me to start off uh, by saying that I usually uh, demur when I'm asked to do these sorts of introductions or comments. I've uh, had the opportunity to do many in my lifetime, and uh, having been there and done that, I usually say no. Uh, perhaps the most memorable uh, in a list that includes some presidents and Fed chairmen and CEOs was that I once inadvertently had to introduce Dr. Ruth. <laughs> um, but that's a story for another day. But when David asked me to introduce William K. Bose Jr., Bill to us, on the occasion of being awarded the Alexis de Tocqueville award by the Independent Institute, I immediately and happily agreed, especially since Bill is being honored, not just for his important work in business entrepreneurship and science, which we've heard a little bit about and I'll remark on briefly, uh, but also for utilizing market-based approaches to greatly enhance the welfare of people in the United States and worldwide, demonstrating that uh, there are, there's a role for government, but there's a lot of good that can come from market-based solutions to people's problems. Bill, as we heard in the video, in which almost every remark I'm going to make was, was presaged or said by those uh, friends of ours, he's not only a tremendously successful venture capitalist and businessman, he's a remarkable human being. No, 
make that beyond remarkable. And for all its amazing achievements, some of which you heard, Bill remains humble and down to earth. He's the last person who would seek praise, let alone revel in it. In fact, he's undoubtedly uncomfortable right now, but Bill, you'll just have to grin and bear it for you more than deserve it. I've known Bill for many years. He was a founder of one of America's most prominent and successful venture capital firms, U.S. Venture Partners, where he and his colleagues brought real-world business experience and ideas, as well as the capital, to the entrepreneurs they funded. He was a founding shareholder of Amgen, and uh, the Amgen participant in that uh, video perhaps didn't do Amgen enough credit. It's one of the world's most important biotech firms. And Bill helped create not just a fabulous investment, but a firm that helps millions of people worldwide fight cancer, kidney disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and other disabling diseases. Bill and Uda are remarkable philanthropists, bringing that business acumen, that intelligence, that scientific knowledge to such important institutions as the Exploratorium, where he recently uh, stepped down as board chairman, the Asian Art Museum, Grace Cathedral, the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, and the UCSF Foundation, where he was chairman of the uh, really important Mission Bay Capital campaign that has proved to be such a success. Now, I have to start by saying, I have to, I have to first intrude here, that Bill had the best early training imaginable preparing him for this beyond remarkable career. He has a BA in economics from Stanford. <laughs> he served in the Army Infantry in the South Pacific in Japan during and after World War II. And I'll reluctantly add his MBA from Harvard where he serves on the visiting committee of the Harvard Business School. <laughs> now we all have to be grateful for you know, the forks we took in the road and the ones not taken. Bill's early career was at Blythe Eastman Dillon where he worked for about a quarter century. They merged with Payne Weber, now part of the Union Bank of Switzerland, known as UBS. And given the current, up to the minute, state of major financial institutions, <laughs> let's pause for a moment and give thanks for the path Bill did not take. <laughs> then again, if Bill had stayed on, maybe they wouldn't be in such trouble. A famous poet once said, T.S. Eliot to be precise, the end of our exploration will be to arrive where we started from and to know the place for the first time. Bill has come full circle. I don't know whether this makes him a glutton for punishment or whether what goes around necessarily comes around, but Bill now also serves on the board of the Hoover Institution and oversees a dozen Stanford economists. I don't know if any of them ever taught Bill back when he was an undergraduate. I doubt it. I know Bill best as a friend and Bohemian Club campmate. It was the membership of Bill and some other remarkable men of what's been called the greatest generation, some of which are here tonight, some of which you've heard, uh, you've heard from, that enticed me to join Hillbilly's camp. And it was one of the best decisions I ever made. How lucky I've been to share not enough, but to share their friendship over the years and to learn from the example Bill and these others have set in their careers and personal lives of living a life well and full and giving so much back to their friends and families, their communities, our nation, and indeed the world. Let me con conclude for a moment by sharing some insights into the man Bill Bowes in addition to what you heard in the video. Coming from academe, I'm used to people having a strong opinion on everything and letting you know it all the time, <laughs> whether, in a, whether or not they know anything about what they're talking about. Wind a professor up and you get a 50-minute lecture about any subject. <laughs> Bill's cut from a different cloth. He doesn't demand to weigh in on every single issue. He's a good listener. He chooses his spots. He's neither loud nor bellicose, always soft-spoken. But as has already been said, when he does speak, people listen, 
and they listen carefully. He's always insightful, sometimes profound, much like de Tocqueville on democracy in America. Always thoughtful, always careful, always a gentleman. And because of all that, he is supremely effective. Unless I end on too serious a note, when I think of Bill, the image that first comes to mind, in current vernacular, his homepage in my mind, is always that big grin, that gentle smile, that great laugh. That's another lesson Bill teaches by example. Relax, have some fun, you don't have to take everything so seriously all the time. There's plenty of time for the serious, but also time to have some fun along the way. And that's how we should think about Bill receiving this wonderful award. An interim recognition along the way, a midterm grade. For there are many good deeds still up Bill's sleeve, many great ideas percolating in his head, and many, many, many good times yet to share. So, Bill, would you come up? Bill, you've been a friend and an inspiration to us and to many people, more than I think any of us can count. And we want to sincerely thank you for all of your work. And to express our gratitude, I want to take this opportunity to present you with our Alexis de Tocqueville Award. It's a small award. It can never, <laughs> it can never duplicate the weight of what you've accomplished. And uh, we're just very grateful and honored to have the privilege of, of making this award to you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, David, and thank you, Michael. I was hoping that my wife heard all those nice words you said. <laughs> I, <I'm, clears throat> she looked pretty surprised. <laughs> I guess the <clears throat> key to uh, what I've been able to accomplish is it lies in the, in the world of entrepreneurship. Uh, everybody knows about Silicon Valley and changing the way the industrial scene looks. <clears throat> but there's another part of entrepreneurship which is social entrepreneurship. I spent the last 15 years or so uh, <clears throat> in that field. Uh, social entrepreneurship, making something from nothing. Something from nothing, I think, defines entrepreneurship. And uh, for instance, uh, a few years ago, a <clears throat> woman in New York decided that there should be a initiative providing many grants and mentoring to starving artists. Simple. Today, <clears throat> this year, 300 starving artists will be getting many grants and mentoring, and more, <clears throat> more to come. A few years ago, a woman in New Jersey decided that uh, our school system be, would be well served by encouraging promising college graduates to spend two years in tough schools. Uh, this year, 3,000 of those college graduates will be spending time, two years at least, in tough schools. The performance in the schools has gone up measurably when these students are, are teaching. And what's really encouraging is that two-thirds of these students stay on in teaching. They don't go, they don't go back to industry. And they go on to become principals and, and uh, on school boards and so forth. A few years ago, a retired executive from a big Silicon Valley company decided to devote the next 25 years of his life to early detection of cancer. Uh, right now, it's, it's a thriving enterprise with, co with co collaborations 
nationwide partnerships with great scientific universities, and I'm sure that they're going to help us detect cancer early. If you catch it early, it's 90% curable, maybe more. Um, a few years ago, uh, a dean of a, of, a, of a department of biology in a very prestigious research institution decided that he couldn't move his field fast enough inside of academia. So he went outside of academia and started an institute which is pushing the next, <clears throat> the next uh, generation of medicine. And he's moving much faster, I think, than he would have staying where he was. These are the kinds of things that I try to dig out and, and support. And uh, it's really fun. And I, I, commend, <clears throat> I commend it to any of you who are in the position to do so. It's more fun than golf, and it's more fun than toys. <laughs> So I, I thank you, David, and I thank you, Michael, for being so kind, and particularly David for choosing me for this, this award. It's a true honor, and I, I do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you again, Bill, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We will now enjoy our main course. <laughs>